2 Peter, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter uh, 3. We're in chapter 3. We're in chapter 3, and we only have four verses to go. We're in verse 14, all right? Verse 14. We, we, have, we have talked the last two Sundays really about heaven and the fact that we're, yes, Sarah? 6,042,000 people in Israel. No, just Jews. Jewish people. All right, there are probably, there are others, but 6 million. And so I would say that there are probably more Jewish people in America still. And, New York City is probably. and so we'll just, but that's how many are in Israel, 6 million. All right, thank you, sir. All right, all right, wherefore, beloved, verse 14, wherefore, beloved, uh, he uses that term, beloved, uh, at least six times. No less than six times does Peter use that term, beloved. Nevertheless, beloved. But I, again, I want to emphasize this. Who wrote the Bible? Really, who wrote the Bible? God did. All right, so really when we read that, wherefore, beloved, it's really... I know that Peter penned it, and he is the author of the book. But when we read it, we need to be reminded that that is God speaking to you and I. And six times in this particular three chapters, he calls us beloved. And we are beloved of God. God does love us in spite of all of our failures. You know, the, the great thing about being saved, and, and I, I try to emphasize this, is that the great thing about being saved is that is what we are. We are saved. We are saved from our sins. Does not mean that we still, uh, I, I like that old song, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. That's what we are. We, we once were sinners. We are now saved and we have become saints. Now it does not mean that saints do not sin because we do. And I, I cannot emphasize that enough, that all of us are prone. That's why uh, the writer of Hebrews says in chapter 12, Wherefore, seeing we are accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside what? What are we here to lay aside? The sins that so easily beset us. Let us lay aside the sins and the weights. There, there are some things that are not sinful, but things that would burden us down. But the, the sins which doth so easily beset us. Uh, many times have we said it's as natural for us to do wrong as it is for a dog to bark. You tell a dog to meow, but hey, he's not going to do that. And you tell sinners to quit sinning, and a lot of people, again, a lot of people try to turn over. Here it is, the, the beginning of, of the new year. And how many are going to turn over a new leaf? I'm going to enroll in the gym. I figure, well, at least they'll give me, you know. But turning over a new leaf won't get it done. So he calls us beloved. Seeing that you look for such things. What things? We're looking for a new heaven and a new earth. Be diligent that you may be found in him in peace when he comes, that when he comes without spot and blemish, and blameless, I'm sorry, and to count that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. God wants people to be saved. Second Peter, we're right there, chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that what? What does all mean? All. All means all. That's what it means. There are lots, there are many, many people who will tell you, well, all doesn't really mean all. Doesn't really mean that. Doesn't really mean that. But some of you Bible scholars, show me a verse in the Bible that says all does not mean all. The Bible says this, for God so loved the I heard a preacher say, 
And I know this preacher. I grew up with him. I went to his father's church. His father, Dr. McKnight, one of the greatest soul winners I've ever known in my life. He took 54 people and built a church of about 1,000. Soul winner. I mean, he was out. Uh, his boy said, who now has the church, went from 1,000 to they run about 150. Now, his boy said, I heard him say it. I heard him say it. That world does not mean world. When the Bible says, for God so loved the world, I heard him say it. World does not mean world. It only means those few people that God has chosen to go to heaven. Thank you. That's wrong. God loved the world that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever. So in 2 Peter 3, 9, when it says this, but he's not willing that any should perish. Now the sad truth is, the sad truth is that many will perish. That's, that's just the way it is. Now, do they have to perish? No. Could they be saved? Yes. See, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you will not come that you might have life. He did not say you cannot come. He said you will not come that you might have life. So when we read there in 2 Peter chapter 3, then in verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. That's what God wants. He wants multitudes to be saved. The sad truth is that most people will not be saved. The sad truth is that today is somebody's last day to be saved. That, that's just the way it is. I heard this. I don't even know where I heard it. 7,000 that can't be right. That can't be right because I believe 240-some thousand people die every day. I, so I, I don't know where this guy got this statistic because he seven. It, it would have to be more than that. But this is what I heard. You know, I, it can't be right, but I, I heard this. That 7,000 people, by the time this night, by the time this day is over, will have seen their last sunrise. I know that can't be true because I know that 240, 214,000 people die. I'm, I probably heard it wrong. I probably heard it wrong. But I know this over 200,000 people die in the United States every day. 200,000 people die in the United States every day. Now, look. Most will not be saved. Very few will be saved. Today is the last chance that some will have to be saved. And once they're, once they're gone, there's no more hope. None. No hope. God is long-suffering. He's long-suffering. He doesn't want to see anyone perish. And it is to salvation. That's what God wants. He wants people to be saved. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to to the wisdom given unto him hath written unto you. Evidently, Paul's first book, Paul's first book, again, they're not in chronological order. The first book that Paul wrote that is in the Bible is the book of what? No. What did Paul write? Now, he's in there. Now, Paul's in there. There's no doubt. The last half of the book of Acts is about Paul and things that Paul said. First First 10, 11, 12, 12 chapters, we find a lot about Peter, but then from then on, it's a lot about Paul. What's the first book that Paul actually penned to a church? Romans. All right, Romans. But that's not the first book he wrote. First book he wrote was probably, was either in 49 AD was Galatians or the book of 1 Thessalonians. You remember in 1 Thessalonians that in Thessalonica, Paul and, and Silas had gotten there in Acts chapter 17 and had seen people saved, and then they got ran out of town. And so Paul, 
uh, they had some questions that Paul evidently had not been able to answer. And so he wrote 1 Thessalonians, uh, those five chapters, uh, that actually it was just a long letter uh, to them. Uh, that was in 50 A.D. Paul may have wrote Galatians in 49 A.D. Uh, there's some questions about it. But, but anyway, when Peter wrote this, the writings of Paul were already being circulated and were considered to be Scripture. Notice in um, the wisdom given in verse 16, also in all his epistles, speaking of them these things, in which are something hearts be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other Scriptures. See, Paul's writings were considered to be Scripture. And we know this from 2 Timothy, I think it's 2 Timothy, it may be 1 Timothy, 3.16 says this, that all what? Scripture. Scripture is given by inspiration of God. So when we read there in verse 16, that uh, as they do the other Scriptures, they evidently at this point counted what Paul had written to be given by God, the Scripture. Now, we have, listen, I, 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 was, I read this about, uh, I, I read about the passing of a guy uh, this week. No, I meant to mention this. Oh, we didn't even pray. We have to pray. We got to pray. While we pray, let me, let me mention this to you. Uh, a really good friend, some of you may remember, Matt may remember Larry Fisher. His wife died yesterday. She was 66. She had had her lung taken out three or four months ago, just never recovered from it. And she passed away yesterday at three. So if, if we could, we, we want to pray. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for another day. Forgive us for not praying, Lord, and asking and inviting you to our services today because, Lord, we surely do want you here. Father, we pray today that you'll meet with us in these few moments. Lord, open your word to us. Open the scriptures to us. Lord, thy word, the holy scriptures, as Paul says, the holy scriptures given by you. Lord, give us some understanding and enlighten us. Open our eyes that we may behold some wondrous thing from thy law. Lord, we pray. Lord, I do want to pray today. There are so many that are afflicted today. I think of Gary Welling, Lord, with cancer. Lord, he's, he's probably not long for this world. Father, we pray for him. We think of uh, a Tony Saxon's wife who's had several strokes. Lord, we pray for her. Lord, there are so many we could pray for. But I do pray for my friend Larry Fisher. It's been many years since I have seen him. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for him, and I pray for the, the children. They're not children anymore. They're grown. But, Lord, we pray for them today. I, I pray for Larry on the passing of his wife. Lord, we do not sorrow as others which have no hope, but we do sorrow. Lord, we are thankful that we shall meet again in that land where no one will ever die. Lord, help Brother Larry today. Lord, while we sorrow at her passing, we rejoice. She's in no more pain. She can breathe freely now. And Lord, we, just, we thank you, Lord, for the promises of thy word and that, Lord, you are so long-suffering in the matter of our salvation. Lord, bless us, we pray, and help us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. I, the thing about Larry, Larry was a long-haired drummer in a rock and roll band when he got saved. Boy, God sure changed his life, what God can do. Now, we were talking about the Holy Scripture that uh, I do not believe. I don't know, I, I'm going to say this about, this guy's name was Ken Hutchins. He was a football player. When he retired, he became a, uh, he, he became a preacher. And I looked at their website. Of, of their church. They, they believe absolutely everything that we believe. Everything that we believe. I believe he was a saved man. Uh, the church put on there about him dying and going to heaven. He had fought cancer for 10 years. But the only thing that they and I would not agree with is this. This is what they say about the Bible. 
We believe that the Bible in its original, in its originals, were inspired by God. Okay, I, I agree with that. But what that means is this, that all we have is a, a reliable, we have a reliable translation. Brother, I don't have a reliable translation. I have the Word of God. See, and, and there are many people, good people, look, good people, who don't understand the issue about the Bible, that Satan, of course, is trying to destroy the Word of God, just like he did back with Eve. Yea, if God said, no, I haven't what God said, but tries to destroy it. We have the Holy Scriptures. Look at 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy for a minute in chapter 1, I believe it is. Maybe 1 Timothy on that, but I believe it's 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1. 2 Timothy, uh, uh, yes. Uh, Says verse 3, I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded of thee also. Now, if we don't have the word of God, you know, people say, well, how did Timothy get saved? What is it about Lois and Eunice? Well, they had a reliable copy. No, we don't need a reliable copy. It says here in Timothy uh, that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. Uh, the Holy Scriptures. All Scriptures given by inspiration of God. Folks, we don't have a reliable translation. We have the Word of God. We have the Word of God. And I know that people will differ on this. I know that they will. God bless them. I love them. Uh, I believe that the Bible, I believe the King James Bible, is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. I know that there are many people who say that, well, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Greek uh, text that uh, uh, the, the Bible was taken from, and uh, it was Erasmus's Greek text, the only pro they say that was inspired and that they took it from that. The only problem with that thought is, and there are good people who believe that, and I'm not going to argue with them about it, is that there were six versions of Erasmus's Greek text at the time of uh, the, the translators translated again uh, in 1611. So I, I believe that God has preserved his word, that he has given it to us, and that not only was it written and it was inspired, but that is still inspired. I cannot emphasize that to you enough that we have the Holy Scriptures given to us. Now, I know that there are good people. I know there are good people. I know that they are. And many of these simply do not understand the issue that, uh, about the Bible, that it is being changed. I've said this before. The only place... In the Bible, that I'll ask you, where is the only place, and don't say the Bible, where is the only place in the Bible that the word Calvary is used? Anybody know? Anybody know where it is? I'll tell you this. It's in one of the Gospels. No. Not Matthew, so now you're down to three. No, not in John, so now you're down to two. No, now you're down to one. So uh, it's in the Gospel of Luke. The only place the word Calvary is used in, in the New Testament. We call ourselves Calvary Bible Church. The only place Calvary is used in the New Testament is in the Gospel of Luke. And the NIV takes it out. So any church that uses an NIV, now, they, they may have it in parentheses, Calvary, whatever, but look, it's the inspired word of God. We got it going. Okay, listen. As also, Paul said in his other epistles, the long-suffering, we are talking even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Paul wrote the scriptures. We are thankful. We are thankful, of course, for the word of God. 
You stop and think about Paul. A couple questions. What kind of guy was Saul? Really, what kind of guy was Saul? What kind of guy was he? Yes, he was. Absolutely. Uh, persecutor. Absolutely. What else do we know about him? He was a persecutor of the church. He, was, he, he had people. He consented unto the death of Stephen. All right? So in our court of law, he was an accessory to the crime. Therefore, he was guilty of it. But he had other people thrown in jail. He had other people probably killed. All right, but what else do we know about him? Uh, okay, what'd you say? He was very educated. Very educated. He was an educated, very educated. Very. What else do we know about him? He was a Roman, all right? Absolutely, he was born that way. When he was beaten in Romans, or Acts chapter 16, and they came and said, the magistrates the next day said, all right, let the guy go. Paul said, well, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. He said, I'm a Roman. You can't beat me and just tell me to let go. When the captain of the guard heard that, he was very afraid. Because you couldn't beat a Roman without just cause. And the, and the captain said, how did you get this? He said, it cost me a lot of money. Paul said, I was freeborn. He said, I was born a Roman. All right, so he was an educated Roman Murderer, persecutor. What else do we know about him? All right. Now we're starting to get somewhere. What else do we know about him? Part of the Sadducees. He was either a Sadducee or a Pharisee, one or the other. Uh, huh? Now we're getting somewhere. He knew the scripture. He was a Pharisee. So we would say this about Paul, that he was very zealous, learned. You're all around the word I'm looking for. Apostle to the Gentiles. Apostle to the Gentiles. We're talking about Saul now. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you. All right. Dedicated. He was a dedicated guy. Oh, well, there we go. Right there. He was religious. Now, everything you said about him was true. All right. But he was very, very religious. But he was very, very, very lost. Saul, now we're talking about Saul. We're not talking about Paul. We're talking about Saul of Tarsus. He was, he was a well-educated member of the religious aristocracy. He had learned that the, the, one of the great doctors of the law was Gamaliel. He said, I, I learned from him. He was a very religious zealot that persecuted the church of God. But God saved him. See, if there's hope for Paul, Saul, there's hope for everybody. Hope for everybody. There are lots of uh, people, people say to me, and I've had people say to me in the last several weeks, Preacher, I'm very burdened about my family. But they'll never get saved. They'll never get saved. Wait a minute. One, have you prayed for them? Two, who would have thought you would be saved? Who would have thought that? Now here you are. You, you don't know. We don't know. We don't know until... Most people, look, most people, if you can sit down with them, most people have never had a clear presentation of the gospel. Now, they may be religious. They, they may know Bible terms, but they're not saved. Say, look, you do realize just because a person goes to church, that doesn't make them a Christian. I mean, really, it's like saying, well, I go down to the barn, that makes me, make me a cat. No. Just because a person goes to, but remember the account that Jesus gave? It was in the Gospel of Luke. I don't remember where it was, about the two guys. One was a Pharisee. He said, Lord, I thank you. I'm not like that guy over there. 
I'm, and basically what he said, I'm very religious. I give a tenth of all that I possess. I fast. How many times a week did he say? Twice a week. I fast twice a week, give a tenth of all that I possess. I am not unjust. I'm not an extortioner. I'm not an adulterer. I'm not like that guy. The other guy was a publican. In the social society of Israel, you couldn't get any lower than a publican. When Jesus called Matthew, he called that guy because they were lying crooks. Zacchaeus said, if I have taken anything falsely, I will restore it fourfold. The publican would not look up to heaven, but beat himself in a sign of contrition upon his chest and merely said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look, and this is what Jesus said. I'm telling you, that guy went down to his house justified. Not the religious guy. There are tons and tons of religious people in the world. Matt. It doesn't matter if you've got the Prince of Preachers as your preacher. Absolutely. Spurgeon said he thought that 70 to 80 percent of his church members were lost. Preachers get saved every week, deacons, Sunday school teachers. Absolutely. We have lost people in our church for sure. Here's the thing about what Matt said. I'm not discounting what Matt said at all. Here's the thing that, you need, that we need to be reminded. What makes a person, a, really, what makes a person a Christian? What makes them a Christian? What makes a person a Christian? Absolutely. Absolutely. When a person realizes, man, I am lost, I have no hope, none, and realizes that Jesus is the only way. What's, what is the Acts? Somebody tell me this. Acts 4.12, what does that say? Acts 4.12, somebody tell me. I know you know it. What is it? After that you have received the hope. No, that's Acts 1.8. Acts 4.12. There is no other name. There is no other name given. Uh, there is no other name given under heaven, or under heaven, given among men, whereby you must be saved. So that means this. This is what it means. That the Muslims are lost. The Buddhists are lost. Shintos are lost. The confused are lost. Religious people are lost. Now they may think they're going to heaven. I'll bet that Pharisee stood on that street corner said, Lord, I'm glad I'm not like that guy over there. I bet he thought he was pretty righteous. And here's what Jesus said. Accept your righteousness. Exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. I, I doubt if there's anybody in here as religious as the Pharisees were. I'll just ask you one question. Do you fast twice a week? Nope, there you go. There you go. So accept your righteousness, exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, how do we do that then? Christ righteousness. See, God loves me not for who I am. No, no, wait, let me, let me say it. Let me, let me rephrase it. God loves me for who I am. All right? But I'm not sure I want to say this. But because God loves everybody. All right, first of all, let's lay that down. God loves everybody. We already know that. God loves everybody. He loves, I know the Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. I know that, but God still loves them. He still loves them. And there's rejoicing in the presence of, uh, of the angels over one sinner that repented. But God, God loves you and God loves me. And God, uh, here, here, here's Alex. I'll say, God accepts us. We are accepted. What did Paul, Peter call us here? Beloved. What did John say? Beloved. I'm sure that Paul said beloved. So we all know it's Holy Scripture given by God. So God says 
we are beloved. That's what we are. I am accepted not because of what I have done or who I am. I am accepted in the presence of God because of the righteousness of Christ and the blood of Christ which cleanses us from all sin. Unless you get high and mighty, so well, I'm a pretty good guy. I beg to differ with you. I, and, and I'm not trying to be unkind. I'm not trying to be unkind. And I know that everybody, most everybody in this room, is attempting to love God and serve God. Now, we fail. I know that. Absolutely. Preacher fails. Everybody fails. Everybody fails. I know that. But one of the, one of the signs, look at 1 John. Look at 1 John for a minute. What time? Wow. Look at 1 John. Look at chapter uh, 1. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse 6. Now, there are seven or eight verses in 1 John. Well, let me just give you two of them. Look at 1 John chapter 1, and verse 4 says, And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness. Now here's a test. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not know or we do not, what he's saying is we do not know or the truth is not in us. Look, if you would, at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. I remember old Lawrence Bringeroff used to say to me, that's talking about lost people. Christians don't sin. He would always tell me that Christians don't sin. And I understand, we've talked about that, we're not going to do it again. In a sense, Christians don't sin. That which is born of God doth not commit sin. But brother, let me tell you, the old flesh still sins. Amen? Now look, so verse 8, John's writing this. If we say, he's including himself. He's talking about saved people. He's not talking about lost people. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. It's like my friend. I, I, I'll never, Larry, Larry, Larry Fisher. I, I, I sent Larry Fisher and, I, and one other guy from the church in Shrewsbury there in Pennsylvania. I sent Larry and another guy to see Jim, and, he, and Larry told me this. This is what Larry told me. Larry said, he said to us, I've never done anything bad enough to go to hell. I, I know better than that because I know people. And the truth is, I know him. But anyway, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I said before, we are sinners saved by grace. Yes, we are saints. Yes, we are. But if we go through a day and say, well, I really haven't done anything wrong today, son, you deceive yourself. Look, here's one of the tests of Christianity. Here's one of the tests. Am I saved? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Before you were saved, let me, let me ask you this question. Before you were saved, before you were saved, if you can remember that. I, I, I'm going to ask my brother Dave. Dave, you were a good Episcopalian, were you not? Tried to be. Tried to be. Tried to be. I've never known. Never mind. I don't want to say it. But anyway. <laughs> Dave, really, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm asking you the wrong question. Before you were saved, you were trying to be, live a religious life, right? You were trying to, trying to. Did, did, maybe I'm asking the wrong question, but I'm going to ask you this. Did, did sin ever really bother you before you were saved? No. No. Before we're saved, sin never bothers us. That's, that's, why, that's why sinners do what they do. Because sin does not bother them. Want, want me to give you a, a, a good a, here is a good test, a good test of, of Christianity. Here is a good test of Christianity. Verse 8. If, uh, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now that I am saved, 
Sin bothers me. Before I was saved, like Dave, like Dave, I had some sense of God. Unlike today, a lot of people really don't even have a sense, of, don't even have a sense of God. Before I was saved, I had some sense of God. Some, but it didn't bother me enough. It really didn't bother me that much. Sin did not bother me. I could sin all day and it never bothered me. I, I, could, I could do wrong all day long. It would not bother me. Now that I am saved, when I sin, it bothers me. That bothers me. Here is, here is a test of Christianity. If we say that we have no sin, uh, really, I, I, you know, I, I'm not that bad. I'm, I'm pretty good. I really didn't commit any sins today. Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, Matt brought up. Charles Spurgeon was. He was a tremendous preacher. Tremendous preacher. Oh, tremendous. I had things written down by Spurgeon. He's just a tremendous preacher. Said this little poem, if the sheep of God could fall away, if they could, alas, my feeble, fickle soul would fall 10,000 times a day. person says, well, I really don't have any sin. I'm not bad. Look, I look at my life, I get so disgusted with myself. If, and if anybody that's an honest thing, when we think of all that Jesus has done for us, how he died on the cross, and, and I'm not much for Hollywood movies. I, I really am not. I, I did not see the passion of the Christ. I would not, I'm not going to go see the passion of the Christ. I'm not going to show the passion of the Christ. I, I saw somewhere a, 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 a small blurb from a movie on the, on the life of Christ. And the only part that I saw was the crucifixion part, and it was, most of it was totally wrong. They had Jesus in a prison cell, and he wasn't in a prison cell. They took him to Pilate, and he was before Pilate, and uh, there were a lot of things wrong with it. But the, the depiction of the beating of Christ, The loss of the, the, the crown of thorns, the Syrian thorns, the that like that, that they made, and they, they shoved down on his head and pulled the beard from his face, and the beating of the whip. And then going to Calvary, the pounding of the nails through his feet and through his wrists. It was horrific. And I do not believe it began to picture what really happened. That's why the Bible says this in Isaiah. His visage was marred more so than any man. Jesus was so badly beaten. You know when it says they struck him about the hand, they struck him about the face with his hand, with their hands? In my opinion, they were closed hands. And they beat him with their fist. The Bible says they struck him with a reed, which I, I consider to be a stick. They took a stick and they beat him over the head with it. And so then I think about myself and how much Jesus loved me. What's that verse in Hebrews 12? Uh, who for the joy that was set before him, I missed the first part. It says, uh, despising the shame, and endured the cross. Despising the shame. And it was shameful. Here is God in the flesh being crucified by religious men. That's why I've said if Jesus came today, you know what they do? They crucify him all over. The Pharisees said, we will not have this man rule over us. Pilate said, and I'm not letting Pilate off in, in any way. And it, his wife came to him and said, I have suffered many bad dreams about this man tonight. Have nothing to do with him. At least three times, according in the Gospel of John. 
At least three times, Pilate tried to have Jesus released. Pilate was afraid of Jesus. Jesus said, it, you couldn't have any power at all unless it was given to thee from above. Then was Pilate more afraid. But he was more afraid of the Jews than he was of Jesus. Now look, one of the tests of Christianity, one of the tests is verse 8. And there, there are many. If, if, if you read, uh, let me just, I think I know one. Um, um, verse 19 of chapter 2. Verse 19. My, me, this is me. One of, one of my tests about Christianity, about a person, is this. And I know it's not a steadfast rule. Verse 19, chapter 2. They went out from us, but they were not all but they were not of us. Notice, they were not of us. They, they weren't saved to begin with. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. Now, one of my tests of Christianity is this. And I know it's not always a, a, a steadfast rule, and, I, and I'm not going to be anybody's judge. Continuance. Really, 2 Peter chapter 3, the last part of that chapter where we're at, that's what it's talking about, about being steadfast. Verse 19 is about being steadfast. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all. Not all. The all. See, all. Which indicates to me, see, they were not all. I'm talking about all the people that went out. There are some, look, I, I, I know the Bible makes it clear that there are people who are saved, who do not continue on. I mean, it, that's, that's clear. Uh, there, are, there are people, there are people who are saved who do terrible things. Again, evidence, the whole book of 1 Corinthians is about a church that was one big mess. And I know that Christians do, but that doesn't mean they're not Christians. It doesn't mean that they're not Christians. But one of the tests of Christianity, I think, is, is faithfulness. Faithfulness. I know that not everybody continues. I know that there are, in this room, people who know people who profess to be saved. We, we pray that they are. We think that they are. They gave evidence to the fact that they were. And if they were, then they are. But they no longer go to church. You can think of, a, you can think of lots of people like that. I can think of lots of people like that. A man who prayed for me for years when I was, uh, after I was saved, a man who prayed for me for years, uh, he was a deacon in the church. He no longer even goes to church. He doesn't go to church anymore. He said, well, what happened? Well, the Bible enjoins us not to grow weary in well-doing because it's obvious that some grow weary and they just throw in the towel. and say, well, I can't do this anymore. I just, I, I give up. So I'm not sure how we got over there, but look back at 2 Peter because it is now obvious to me at 25 after, that we got two verses covered and we have two more to go, that we are not going to get through them. Um, so let's uh, stop right there at verse 15 and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, who was a murdering, lying, educated, religious zealot that God saved. Uh, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you again that you love us in such a wonderful way. Oh, God, how you do love us. Oh, God, in spite of all of our failures, I look at my life. Lord, how often I fail. 
And I believe that any honest Christian in this room would say, Lord, how oft we fail. Fail you, Lord. But we thank you that you love us. And we're not accepted because of our failures. We're accepted because of the righteousness of Christ, which we have. We thank you for our advocate, the Lord Jesus, even though that wicked one is at the making accusation against us and laughing at us, belittling us, that we have an advocate today that pleads our case before the throne of grace. Lord, we thank you for him today, for our Savior and our soon coming King, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen and amen.